so care, care for the rare, essentially it's um, about establishing collections of rare and threatened plants in regional botanic gardens across the state. Um, but for that project to be facilitated through the guise of RBG and, um, uh, and BGANS Victoria. Um, care for the rare, so I, I, I am going to look at a little bit of uh, BGANS as an entity uh, and BGANS' work in capacity building and supporting regional botanic gardens in being, regional, in, in being botanic gardens. So there's a little bit of the talk which is talking about BGANS and BGANS capacity building. Um, but the majority of the talk is actually talking about the Care for the Rare project and uh, a, a bit of an update for those that might have seen bits and pieces before. Um, BGANS has got a business plan and there's a whole bunch of stuff in the business plan which is about provision of uh, member benefits and services, holding meetings, newsletters uh, and, the, and the like. Um, but you know, some of the things in the business plan are about promoting uh, and advocating on behalf of, uh, of regional botanic gardens. Uh, professional development opportunities, seminars, uh, those, those types of things. But the, the last point that I've put there is for BGANS to support collaborations across collections. Uh, and there's an interesting new group which is starting, which is called Be Calm, and I'll talk to that in a, in a minute. But for, uh, I think a new focus area for BGANS is, is uh, increasingly about supporting uh, collaborations between botanic gardens and sharing plant material. Um, that's a new dot point that I, that I think might have come out of today. I don't think it's in the current business plan. I think it'll be in the next business plan without a doubt. Um, Tim Rowe, who was here before, I, I think he articulated in a really meaningful way a few years ago that the role of BGANS is to really support botanic, regional botanic gardens with limited resources and you know, m modest resources in real terms to be botanic gardens. The majority of botanic gardens in Victoria and by default across Australia are actually funded by local government authorities. Now local government are really good at provision of services, things like um, uh, resources for a, for a botanic garden, things like um, services, marketing, community engagement, events, and a whole range of different things that local government just do with, with their eyes closed. But it's difficult to expect to look to local government for guidance and inspiration when it comes to managing the nuances of living collections in botanic gardens. So really, you know, what Tim was articulating is that the, the, one of the real functions of Big Ans as an entity is filling the void. You know, the sort of information that we've he heard here today wouldn't be generated by uh, by parks managers necessarily, um, or, or, or by councillors, or, or by local government at all. So, a really important function of BGANS is to get together as a network uh, and and actually talk technically about the business of running a botanic garden. So, it's a, 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 I think that definition supporting regional botanic gardens to be botanic gardens is you know it's almost the byline of BGANS Victoria. Um, BGANS Vic have been on the front foot for many, many years in terms of capacity building projects um, and there's a, a bunch of them here and I'll go through them really quickly. Uh, a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, we developed a collections planning toolkit which was really a, a sort of a how-to guide for regional botanic gardens in establishing, managing, developing, curating uh, living, living collections. Um, it predominantly was rolled out to a couple of workshops in Victoria but then went up and down the eastern seaboard uh, and this collections toolkit that started at BGANS Vic actually was delivered to the South Korean um, Botanic Garden Network as a part of the Dunedin Con Congress. The toolkit itself, um, it's still available on the BGANS website. I think it still stacks up as a, uh, a really good reference document in terms of looking back and just, uh, just testing some of the assumptions that we make along the way in developing living collections. Um, some really nice case studies and, um, you know, it's the... It's a bit of a how-to how guide, and that was something that was initiated by Big Anz Vic. Uh, there's a, a, a current, currently a plant records project. Uh, a survey that Donna spoke to at the last network meeting indicated that 90% of botanic gardens in this room are dissatisfied with record keeping. I really liked Liam's, any record keeping is good record keeping, but we can do it better than good. Um, so essentially we're looking um, there's a, a, a working group, uh, BGANS Vic working group, which is looking at engaging a third party provider, getting some off the shelf software that we can make available to members of the BGANS network for a fraction of the setup costs. So uh, essentially looking at something like RSBG, and I think Donna 
Thomas indicated that RSBG for the Ballarat Botanic Gardens was something in the order of a $15,000 investment. You know, we're looking at providing access to a version, and it might be low end, um, but well considered. We're looking at providing access for a version of something like RSBG or something comparable for a fraction of the cost. Um, and that's, again, a, a really nice initiative which has come out of Big Anne's Vic. Um, we're about to, we've got a short list of potential providers. We've uh, established an EOI, uh, Tex, Donna, David Cash, uh, Justin, Tim, Ubergang. There's a working group that have been working on this, on this particular project. We're about to send an EOI out to suppliers and they'll come back and say, this is what we can do for you. But the aim of this is to be, for, for Big Anne's to be a provide a botanic garden platform to support regional botanic gardens in managing records. There is a, a new and emerging group called Be Calm, um, which is Botanic Gardens, but, oh, sorry, Botanic Gardens Collections and Record Management Group. John Sandham, uh, Ben Light, and Peter Simons have been the drivers of that, and it's essentially moving on from the Record Officer Network Group, which was has been in place for a while, but not all that active but introducing this living collections support ag uh, uh, agenda. So broadening the terms of reference, if you like, for managing plant records in botanic gardens to managing collections in, plant in botanic gardens with plant records being a key component. Um, advocacy, there's some, Big Anne's Vic have been doing some really nice uh, active advocacy in speaking um, with Jenny from Shepherd and the other, about a month ago we wrote a letter to, Big to uh, Shepherd and Council uh, advocating for more resources to be, well, just for some focus to be placed on, on, on the garden. Uh, and delightful to hear from Jenny that there's a full-time gardener now at the Shepherd and Botanic Gardens for the first time. Now, we can't claim that. We, uh, Jenny can. Um, <laughs> it's, really, it's, it's really pleasing, Jenny. So, you know, big ends if you can't claim that, but the advocacy role couldn't have hurt. Um, so there's been lots of active advocacy and, and there's some of the gardens that we've been supporting over the last little while. Uh, promotion, Tim Hubergang, this, I don't know how many thousands of hits it got, it was something like 45,000 hits. Um, it was the most popular, it, yeah, it was, it went, can a botanic garden video go viral? <laughs> <laughs> this thing might have gone close, um, in botanic garden parlance. Um, but a terrific, a again, initiated out of Big Anne's Vic with uh, implications for the whole of the network. Uh, onto the conservation agenda, there's the dictionary definition, the, the one that gets rolled out, documented collections for, of research, science, conservation, education, interpretation and display. And I if you were to really drill down to regional botanic gardens with modest resources, there's a couple of real stretch targets in that definition. Research, science, conservation, some of those are have, have proven to be stretch targets for regional botanic gardens with modest resources. Care for the rare is Big Anne's attempt to build capacity um, within the network to, to actually build, build capacity to actually start to facilitate some of those uh, more nuanced um, uh, elements of that, that dictionary definition. So it's bringing some conservation, it's bringing a conservation agenda to regional botanic gardens. Um, that it have otherwise struggled. Um, I'm going to skip over some theory of conservation, but integrated plant conservation is using a number of different tools and, and, and targets. Um, essentially, there's a couple of components. Manage, manage threatened plants in the wild, manage threatened plants in ex situ holdings, and then there's education and research components. The term integrated plant conservation was uh, penned by a fellow called Don Fork at the initial, uh, the inaugural uh, Australian Network for Plant Conservation Conference using different tools. Uh, and for botanic gardens, um, uh, there's a term called conservation horticulture, which is starting to get some traction. Uh, and that's essentially, you know, going back to the old, the, the initial iteration of the Society for Growing Australian Plants, the byline for that particular group was cultivation through, conservation through cultivation. And essentially this Care for the Rare project is revisiting that concept of uh, participating actively in conservation initiatives and uh, through uh, growing, growing plants, which is what we do really well as a botanic garden network. Sephora Toromiro became extinct in 1960. 
Um, and if it weren't for the fact that Sephora Toromira was sitting on a number of benches in a number of botanic gardens, sort of scattered worldwide, uh, Sephora Toromira would have been completely lost. Um, uh, recently, a couple of months ago, six months ago, the Melbourne Gardens actually sent some seed to Montreal Botanic Gardens as a part of this distribution. But the backstop to extinction of Sephora Toromira, um, extinct in the wild, but the backstop to the, the insurance policy was, was actually plants sitting on benches in a, a number of botanic gardens scattered across the world. Coming closer to home, Victoria, about a third of Victoria's plant species are afforded with some level of conservation significance. So uh, you go in the bush, species one safe, species two safe, species three conservation significance, a third of the flora. Um, and if you couple that with, uh, there should be 42 dots up there. We always claim that there's 42 regional botanic gardens in Victoria. There's not 42 dots there. I haven't been able to work it out. Um, but if you couple that with uh, that we've got this fantastic network of botanic gardens which are across a number of key bioregions across the state, you pose the question, is there a role for regional botanic gardens in, um, in plant conservation? A third of the flora having afforded some level of conservation significance and the capacity, the potential capacity of 42 gardens to contribute to the conservation of local species, the answer to that is, is, is yes, there's certainly a, a role for regional botanic gardens to be actively participating in the conservation of their local, local threatened species. Um, drill down a bit further and pose that question, is it actually happening in um, regional botanic gardens across the state, the conservation of locally significant threatened species? And the answer to that is it's, it's, it's a relatively small number of gardens that have got conservation holdings. There's a lot of our gardens that are heritage gardens that have got um, plants of conservation significance, like Pinus toriana at the Castle Main Botanic Gardens. You know, that thing is critically endangered uh, in a couple of islands off the coast of California. Um, and, and that's completely legitimate plant conservation. But um, if, if you were to look at the, the number of botanic gardens in the state, which are actively involved in the conservation of the local species, uh, it's a much smaller number. Um, Paul Tracy, who's current chair of BGANS, did a, a, a survey of regional botanic gardens um, across the network. Uh, and um, it, it clearly indicated, Paul's research clearly indicated that in Victoria, um, indigenous plants or the conservation of local species uh, is currently not a focus, which was uh, terms, uh, Paul's, Paul's words. Um, so there was a gap uh, in the, there was a gap in uh, in that. It's, it's interesting to note that this is a, 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 a word cloud uh, which is based on that survey that Donna and others did looking at plant records. And if you have a look at that, there's been some significant shifts which are happening in the, the makeup of collections in botanic gardens. If you were to compare that to the original survey that we did in, in 2000, many, many more conservation collections, many more ecological collections, many, many more collections which are based on native plants or local native plants. So there's some shifting which is, which is happening and, and I guess Care for the Rare is really about supporting that shift. Um, why are there so few regional botanic gardens participating in the conservation of local species? Uh, and it's a sign of the historic times. Um, I've said this a few times, but by, by um, 1870, there were 21 regional botanic gardens in Victoria. Uh, New South Wales had one, Queensland one, Tassie one, Kings Park wasn't even thought of. Ga botanic gardens of South Australia, you know, one, one garden. Uh, and we had 20 regional botanic gardens by 1870. And that was about gold and it was about burgeoning communities and a mechanics institute and a library and a botanic garden. They were measures of the maturity of these you know, burgeoning communities. But they weren't established along scientific grounds. They were es established as pleasure parks, as places to promenade, um, and very, very much influenced by uh, the European um, design ethic. Uh, we, we refer to them today as, as these magnificent heritage gardens, and we've got this legacy, this magnificent legacy of, of, of gardens that were established in the 1880s through the state. Um, but they weren't based on science. They were based on on amenity and they were based on as pleasure parks. That was the reality of the situation. Um, throughout the, the, the sale gardens was an interesting one because sale was typical of many 
botanic gardens throughout the 20th century. A lot of our botanic gardens fell into complete disrepair. Um, they were managed, they weren't managed as bot being botanic gardens, they were managed as parks, um, or, or they were almost ignored, that whole botanic agenda throughout a lot of the 20th century across a number of regional botanic gardens in the state. Um, the, the really nice, so, so very few of the, the point is very few of the regional gardens that were established in the 1880s had curatorial continuity throughout, throughout their history. Uh, maybe a handful did. Um, the, really, the really nice thing is that there was a, a, a lovely correction which, is, which happened in the early 2000s uh, and regional botanic gardens in Victoria have gone through this complete renaissance period. Uh, and I think that yeah, master plans and major capital developments, a whole range of um, uh, new gardens, Shepparton, Gagaro, uh, Echuca Moama, Wama, I've put the Dandelong Ranges garden in even though it's been there for a while as a new um, botanic garden. And I, and I think there was an absolute correlation between the Friends Group movement and botanic gardens actually starting to, to do some interesting things again. Um, uh, without a doubt, there's uh, uh, an effective Friends Group often is coupled with a garden which are doing progressive, progressive things. So a big shout out to the, to the, to the Friends. Um, so there has been a renaissance of, 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 of gardens in Victoria. Uh, over many years, so, so Big Anne's Vic have been active, and it wasn't Big Anne's Vic, it was called the Victorian Botanic Gardens Network. And we met for the first time at the Geelong Botanic Gardens in October uh, 2000. And since then, uh, I think there's been a really cohesive uh, group of people that have been looking out for the interests of regional botanic gardens in the state. It morphed into Big Anne's in 2009, eight. I don't, I'm not really sure. But Big Anne's Vic is clearly, look at this room, it's, it's filled with 130 people. It's clearly you know, the most active of all the, 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 the regional groups within the Botanic Garden, within the Big Anne's regional group network. Um, and getting plant conservation onto the agenda has been on the agenda for a, a, a little while for the Big Anne's committee uh, with a whole bunch of uh, 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 programs and training opportunities and the like to try and facilitate that. Uh, we undertook a phone survey uh, and it was anecdotal and informal but the phone survey and the question was are there impediments to, for, for your garden to participate in the conservation of local plant species and, and if there are impediments what are the impediments um, and what came through and it came through in Liam's talk the, the, the Sale Botanic Garden set up a rare and threatened plant bed and it, and it didn't completely succeed because of the difficulty in sourcing plant material. So accessing plant material was perceived as a really big impediment for, uh, for regional botanic gardens in the state to, to participate in conservation of local species. Um, there was a lack of confidence in some respects to, that, ev that these collections could be uh, managed and curated with the resources that botanic gardens have available. Uh, and the last one's an interesting one because it was about a, per a perception that uh, indigenous plants would be incongruous in a, a heritage landscape, that they'd be some, somehow out of character. Um, so there was a, a genuine perceived impediment that, that a, a heritage landscape and indigenous plants, it's uh, you know, a syntax error. There's, there, was a, there was a tension there, a real a genuine tension there. Um, so that they were the anecdotal, that was the anecdotal feedback that we had from the survey. So with that, uh, we reflected on a project that happened in 1996 for the 150th year of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Melbourne, where the RBG Melbourne um, c distributed a whole range of really interesting um, trees and shrubs predominantly to regional botanic gardens across the state. I think it was called the Flora of Victoria project. Does that sound right? Yeah. A really successful project that distributed plant material and we, th we, we, we the committee reflected on is there an opportunity for us to do something like that again but this time doing it distributing interesting plant material to regional botanic gardens but this time distributing plant material which has got conservation significance um, and that kind of seeded the the um, care for the rare projects so there's this multi-site uh, conservation collection of victorian v rots victorian rare and threatened plant species so it, w it, was, it was drawing on the success, I think, of, of this particular pro project in 1996 and just reimagining it.
Um, essentially, the aim of Care for the Rare is for RBGV as it stands now, with through Began's uh, Victoria, to grow and distribute rare plants to regional botanic gardens. That's that's the that's at the essence of it. There's a whole bunch of other aims, but I'll skip through them um, to talk about the the actual project and and the stages of the project. The 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 first. So it's a five-stage project. The first stage is to undertake an assessment of the of that list of the third of the, the the plants in the Victorian flora to ascertain what species would be suitable for inclusion in the project. So it was a de desktop exercise undertaken by Dave Roberts, who's a, a horticulturist at the Melbourne Gardens, and he got out the list and assessed against some really specific criteria. Um, the first the first one was. Um, uh, how easy or difficult are they to grow? So something like a Eucalyptus porciflora subspecies Hydrea, long-lived, could be reasonably easy to grow compared to a Diurus, Diurus fragrantissima, which would be, you know, difficult and you know exacting in its requirements. Um, and it <coughs> the Eucalypt scored long-lived, easier to grow, sc scored a bigger number. It got a 4.5. The Diurus probably got a one. Um, so Cultivate, cultivatable, is that a, no, I don't think that's a word. Um, propagatable, <laughs> that's probably not a word either, but the same criteria. Uh, Euphrasia, hemiparasitic, really tricky to propagate compared to something that you sow the seed and it germinates. Um, uh, availability of plant material was another, if, if we could access it through the Victorian Conservation Seed Bank or living collections at the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria, gardens or other holdings, um, it actually scored a bigger number than having to um, go into the field and actually do some wild collecting for this particular thing. This is a super pragmatic approach that we're, that we're taking here. Um, conservation status is obviously a consideration, um, uh, other general comments, but the really big one was proximity to, to gardens. So which bioregion does this particular rare plant come from and how close is that to the, to the adjoining botanic garden? And the emphasis has been to sort of link those. Um, proximate to a botanic garden um, sc was a, scored a bigger number uh, than if it was, you know, something from Mildura. Uh, that is that that it, it it wouldn't make sense for that thing in Mildura to be cultivated in the care for the rare collection at Sale, for example. So proximity to to bioregions was another consideration. Um, and finally, ornamental attributes. Uh, Finding that sweet spot between things of conservation significance that are unremarkable, and because a good number of them are, and having some real showstoppers um, in, in, in the mix. So a super pragmatic desktop assessment was undertaken by Dave Roberts as step one. Um, the second one was to open up the project to expressions of interest from the network. Um, and essentially that was about, again, a desktop exercise to um, at least measure in part the capacity of, 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 of gardens to have holdings. Um, and the amazing, so it explored a whole range of criteria, um, which was a, a, again a, a desktop measure to measure capacity uh, in, in real terms. But the fantastic thing was that we had 24 expressions of interest from regional botanic gardens across the state. So greater than half of the, of the gardens in the state said we want to have part of this project which was really, really pleasing. Um, it was pleasing and overwhelming in the same breath uh, because the service um, to grow plants, rare and threatened plants, um, uh, to work out what to grow with the gardens, to ac actually grow those plants on um, and then distribute them to 24 gardens would, would have been a real stretch. Um, so we got some lovely funding from the Helen McPherson Smith Trust and just to reiterate that they're big supporters of today's program um, to uh, undertake a, a, a pilot project with six gardens. Uh, and the six gardens are uh, the Wilson Botanic Park, the Dandenong Ranges Botanic Garden, Australian Botanic Garden, Shepparton, Colac, Ballarat and Sale Botanic Gardens. They were the, they were the six. And they were selected because they were representative. Some gardens at that time um, were managed completely by, by volunteers. Not so much now in Shepparton, they have a staff member, yes. Um, but, uh, you know, overtly native gardens, gardens with exotic holdings, heritage gardens, we tried to get a mix. 
uh, of gardens in, in, the, in the pilot. Um, the, the key to the project was for the working group to visit the gardens, spend time with the, the garden curators, the garden managers, the horticulturists, and um, sort of co-establish a really sensible approach for each of the collections. Uh, and there's uh, Lawrence and Co at uh, the Colac Botanic Gardens, and I'll talk in some detail about it. But then the, the, this is the really interesting stage, and this is where we're at at the moment. So we've written collections plans, conservation collections plans for all six of, of the gardens. We know what the approach is. We've got species lists. Um, and now the team of, uh, of uh, nursery technicians and horticulturists at the Cranbourne Gardens Nursery are starting to do the propagating um, for, for the project. And they look, don't they look delighted at the prospect? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so plant production is, uh, is commenced and commencing. Uh, and the last stage is once the material has been propagated, uh, grown on at the, at the Cranbourne Gardens Nursery, um, it'll be distributed to, to each of the participating gardens for, for installing into the, in, into the gardens. Um, and there's a very proud, this has got nothing to do with us, but we can sort of claim that as a nice image. This is the Ballarat Botanic Gardens are getting some Lepidium pseudo hysopophyllium from Delwop, I think. Is that right? Something like that. Um, some of the, uh, the collections. So the uh, approach that we're taking uh, at the Dandenong Rangers Garden, Dandenong Rangers Garden have established a Victorian alpine plant collection at Serenity Point. And essentially the, care, the entire care for the rare focus for the Dandenong Rangers Garden is introducing um, alpine plants, subalpine plants, montane plants and tall open forest species uh, that have been selected from that list uh, that, that Dave shortlisted off. So V-ROTs that, that, uh, from those um, environments to be dropped into the existing Victorian Alpine collection uh, at the Dandenong Rangers Garden. Um, the collection at Colac, Colac uh, probably years ahead of its time in, in real terms by establishing a rainforest garden and a heathland garden. Proximity to the Otways and you know, Lawrence and Co had some real vision uh, years ago to establish a rainforest garden. The Care for the Rare project is actually introducing some plants of conservation significance into that existing landscape. And I know Lawrence from Colac has been here. He's been chasing the tall Astelia uh, probably since he established the garden in the 1990s. Um, Mandy sourced, I think, 20 tall Astelias for you, Lawrence, last week. So um, there's some tall Astelias coming your way. I think it was 20, maybe 20. Uh, the Botanic Garden at Shepparton, it, it's based on one long wall. So there's the rare plant wall, the rare plants wall. Um, it's about 120 metres long, two metres wide, uh, and um, uh, landscape architect Melissa Stagg has done a really lovely design which is incorporating uh, really appropriate uh, climate matched uh, rare and threatened plants to be added into that collection alongside a, a, a host of indigenous plants. So it's an indigenous plant bed with a rare plant focus, um, which has been beautifully designed by Melissa Stagg. Sale Botanic Gardens, uh, it, it, they may well have kick-started this project by uh, um, attempting, to, uh, uh, attempting to developing a rare and threatened plant bed and finding it a really difficult ta task. Um, you know, it, it did put some impetus on the committee to, to do something about this access to plant material. It might have triggered the project. Um, and that's a Banksia canii and um, Bill Kane is a, a, a plant from those, those parts. So again, growing plants in the sale botanic gardens that are sale plants and telling sale stories. Wilson Botanic Park in Berwick, uh, a whole range of opportunities uh, are presenting in Wilson Park. Um, we think the main one for Wilson Park is going to be plants from the city of Casey uh, and plants that come from various rainforest environments. Um, Ballarat Botanic Gardens, there's a 40, it says 50, but there's a 40 kilometre radius and that's where we selected plants from. So plants es essentially from the, 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 the greater Ballarat uh, region is, is where the focus. Again, the Ballarat Gardens have established an indigenous plant garden with some rare plants and we'll be augmenting that and effectively doubling the size of that garden through the Care for the Rare project. Um, th th a really big aim of the project is interpretation uh, and telling those stories to local constituent communities. Um, we think this time next year we'll be holding a Big Anne's 
uh, network meeting with a focus on interpreting plant collections. Absolutely a, an essential thing for each of the participating gardens, but it will be made uh, open to uh, the broader network. And as we've talked about from Dave's talk this morning, it's this, we know what the messaging is, but we're not all that good at getting those messages across. So this is an opportunity for these gardens to absolutely focus on some messaging, um, but the potential rub for the rest of the network is to get together and talk about how we communicate, how we tell our plant stories. Um, timelines, we've got funding up until um, the end of 2020, uh, at which point we're really hoping um, that this is a roaring success and that we can go back to the McPherson Smith Trust and or other potential funders uh, and get some more funding for, um, for subsequent stages and roll it out to another six gardens and another six gardens and maybe over the next, I don't know, I, I won't put a time on it, but over the next period, um, all 24 gardens that have expressed interest have got rare plants supported by the Big Anzivik and the RBG uh, and this Care for the Rare initiative. So thanks for the opportunity to talk to that today.